How to derive Snell's law of refraction. Imagine a boundary between two media with different refractive indices. For example, we could choose air and glass. Now let's add on an incident ray of light. Any ray would do, but I'm going to choose an angle of incidence of 48 degrees so that the numbers turn out nice and convenient. Because our ray is moving into a material with a higher refractive index, the ray will change direction and the angle of refraction will be less. With our chosen values, it turns out to be 30 degrees. As I said, the specific angles aren't actually important, so let's hide them. And let's consider not just one ray, but many. Next, mark on a wavefront in a random location. Wavefronts are always 90 degrees to the direction the waves are moving. I'm going to choose light with a wavelength of 6 centimeters, as that turns out to be convenient, but again, any value would work just fine. In the glass side, it's a similar story. Mark on the wave fronts. Here we have two of them, so we can actually measure the wavelength in the glass. Turns out here we have four centimeters, and we can check that using Snell's law just to be sure. After that, pick out two specific rays from the whole set. We want the rays that meet a wave front exactly at the boundary. If your rays are too spread out, draw on extra rays. After some simplification, we have this diagram. If we now mark on the normal, that's 90 degrees to the boundary, and mark on various right angles, we can apply some maths to deduce some very important angles. First, this angle plus theta 1 must add up to 90 degrees, and then the three angles of any triangle must add up to 180, so this angle here must also be theta 1. We can apply the same process for theta 2 in the second medium, completing it as so. You will probably be glad to hear that our diagram is now complete. The only thing left to do is erase things we don't need and label some important points. There are three parts to the rest of this derivation and they all follow the same structure. Starting knowledge, then some working, then a con conclusion. In this case we're going to start with the observation that in a certain amount of time, capital T, ray 1 moves from B to C and ray 2 moves from A to D. We're also going to use the definition of refractive index and the definition of speed. Substituting into the speed definition for the ray in air yields this. And doing this for the ray in glass gives this. We can rearrange both equations to make T the subject. And now if both BC over V1 and AD over V2 are equal to T, then they must also be equal to each other. So we combine them. Finally, rearrange these and we have V1 over V2 is equal to BC over AD. Combining this equation with the definition of the refractive index produces this. Now it might not look overly useful at this stage, but trust me it will be. We need to use the conclusion from the last slide plus some trigonometry from maths. For any right angle triangle, the sine of the angle is always equal to the length of the opposite side divided by the length of the hypotenuse. For the triangle in air, marked green, that gives sine theta 1 is equal to BC over AC. And for the triangle in glass, red, that gives sine theta 2 is equal to AD over AC. Rearranging, combining, and then rearranging again yields this. Substituting that into the initial equation produces this, and we are clearly on track. For the final part, we need the work so far, the V equals F lambda equation, and an observation about frequency. The frequency of waves inside the glass is equal to the frequency in the air. Now that might not seem very obvious to begin with, but if you think about the alternative then it should become clear. If the frequency was less inside the glass, then that would mean more waves were entering it than were leaving it each second. Over time that would lead to a buildup of light and thus a buildup of energy, and if that was actually the case, then any material with a refractive index higher than air would be melted by even the most feeble of light sources. Now we don't see that, so that's obviously not the case. Substituting into V as F lambda for both air and glass gives us this. And then once again we rearrange, combine, and then rearrange again. Finally, we combine the latest result with our starting equation, and we're finished. I've tried to make this derivation as short as possible without missing out any of the parts. I recommend you go through each section carefully until you understand every step. To test your knowledge, try and reproduce the whole proof without using the video at all. 
specific values and a scale diagram are not required and I would also appreciate any feedback you care to offer.